fastest stock market crash in history. Is this the end game? I'm going to do my very best to answer that for you in three simple, fast steps. Before I move forward, I want to make sure I define the stock market crash. We'll do that just like CNBC, and that is a 10% decline from the peak. Editor, go ahead and throw up that chart from Deutsche Bank that CNBC used. And I also want to point out that the stock market, as of this morning, Friday morning, when we're shooting this video, is down another 500 points. Let's go right back and start with step number one. Let's set the stage of all the players and the economy and how this all interacts with one another. Pension funds, corporate bond market, the stock market. The stock market is dealing with the banks and the Federal Reserve. This is you right here in the middle, the consumer with a sign that's just saying, help, help. And we've got the banks issuing more debt to you. You are the main driver of the economy with government spending. And the Fed is propping up the government with more of their money. But to understand how this system is a lot different now than it has been in the past, especially during past expansions, let's go right to the Peter Schiff podcast, one of my favorites. See, we've had the longest recovery, the longest expansion in history. Now, of course, it's required the most amount of monetary and fiscal stimulus in history, uh, but they were able to produce it. But normally during an expansion, consumers pay down their debt, right? They, 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 they go into debt during the recession. And then when times are good, they make more money. They pay off their debts. They, they fix up their balance sheets. The same thing with the government. The government typically runs these big deficits during a recession. And then when you have an expansion, uh, the deficits come down. I mean, they generally don't run surpluses, but at least the deficits shrink as the government no longer has to spend as much on automatic safety you know, nets and stimulus. And all of a sudden, the government gets more tax revenue from increased economic activity. So a genuine economic expansion, a real boom, uh, you know, fills the, the Treasury's coffers. So now when the next downturn comes, they're in a better position uh, to, to handle a, an increase in the deficit. And of course, if consumers, you know, have built up their savings and you go into a recession, they have some money in reserve. They're OK. But this expansion has been different in that everybody levered up even more. Peter does a great job of pointing out that now the players in the system are far more leveraged than they've ever been during an expansion. So then the question becomes, how much more leveraged are they? To figure that out, let's go right to the charts. Let's start with a chart of government deficit spending. You'll notice we've only been at these levels during past recessions. And during a recession, the deficit goes through the roof. As an example, during the last recession, the deficit went up to 10% of GDP. So if we're already at between 4 and 6% of GDP during the longest expansion in US history, so it's safe to assume during the next recession that we could be in right now, deficits could go up to 12, 15%, maybe even higher. It doesn't get much better when we look at the state pension funds. All but two states are in the red. A lot of states are underfunded by over 50%. And this is for another video, but I'd like to point out that even these numbers are far too optimistic because they're factoring in a 7% return on a moving forward basis. And we know that that is completely unrealistic, especially in a recession. The corporate bond market could be the catalyst to this whole house of cards imploding. On this chart, we see that U.S. corporate debt relative to GDP is at an all-time high. 
Let's move on to the consumer, which is 70% of US GDP. How are they doing? Not well. If you look at the total amount of debt outstanding, it's over $4 trillion, 65% higher than it was prior to the last crash, and over double where it was as recently as the early 2000s. And one thing I'd like to highlight here, the light blue section, which has grown substantially, is revolving credit. That means that it's extremely sensitive to changes in interest rates. The data definitely backs up exactly what Schiff was saying, but let's think through the systemic risks in the system even further. The pension funds go into the corporate bond market because they can't get yield anywhere else. The Federal Reserve has kept rates so low for so long, they can't meet their liabilities. Remember, they need to get a 7% return. The corporations borrow this money from the pension funds. What do they do with it? They go right into the stock market and buy back their own shares. Remember that since 2010, the net buyers or the biggest net buyers in the stock market have been corporations. So you get this weird doom vortex between corporations and the stock market where the corporations buy back their own shares. That raises the stock market. As the stock market goes higher, it makes it easier for corporations to borrow more money. But of course, that can work in reverse order. That's systemic risk. Also, let's remember that the banks are pretty much financing the stock market and the corporate bond market through the Fed printing up all this funny money, taking their balance sheet to over $4 trillion. The Fed also financed the government deficits. And whether we like it or not, whether the talking heads at CNBC like to admit it, the Fed is monetizing that debt. The government takes that money, they inject it into the economy. If it wasn't for government deficit spending, let's remember that real GDP would actually be negative. So the economy is propped up solely by consumer spending and government spending, which is totally unsustainable. But the consumer's confidence in other words, how much he's willing to spend is also propped up by the pension funds, the corporate bond market, and the stock market, and is predicated upon the bank's willingness to continue to lend them more and more money, meaning that it asset prices that the consumer owns aren't continually going up. That means this flow of debt going to the consumer, which is propping them up, therefore propping the economy up, stops immediately. I said that there was a doom vortex between the corporate bond market and the stock market. But as you can see, this entire system is a doom vortex. It's all interconnected. And if one of these components goes, it can bring the whole system crashing down. I'd also like to point out that during a recession, Unemployment goes up. We all know that the unemployment rate is at all time lows, but we're still loaded down with all of this debt. So think about what happens in the next recession to that consumer when unemployment goes up. That could also be a catalyst that brings this whole thing down. Also in a recession, tax revenues go down. So what happens to government spending and the pension funds if the taxes coming from the consumer go down along with the consumer's unemployment rate going up? But the main takeaway from step number one shouldn't just be about the systemic risks in the system. It should also be about the fact that the entire system is driven by two things that we'll address later on in this video. Interest rates and confidence. And oh, by the way, I just checked the stock market again, maybe 10, 15 minutes later, it's now down 900 
in 24 points. Step number two is brought to you by your friend and family member, Fred, who says, don't worry about anything, especially not interest rates, because the Fed is in control. Are they? Well, this is a chart going back to 2007. So for going from April of 2007 to December of 2007. And I'd like to point out that this chart was emailed to me specifically for my videos from Jeff Snyder. So a big shout out to Jeff Snyder at Alhambra Investments. But it goes from 3% interest up to 6%. This black line is the Fed funds target rate. That's when Ben Bernanke, Janet Yellen, Jerome Powell comes out on TV and says, we are lowering or raising the interest rate to X, Y, Z. That is the Fed funds target rate. It's very clear that before August of 2007, pretty much wherever the Fed funds rate was supposed to be, was exactly where the effective rate was. And that effective rate is indicated by this blue line. You say, what's that red line, George? That is LIBOR. In other words, the interest rate for the Euro dollars. And we don't even want to go down that rabbit hole in this video, <laughs> as you know. But if you haven't seen my Euro dollar videos, check out the one I did yesterday and part two of the full-length interview with Jeff Snyder this Sunday. But the whole point is that these interest rates were in lockstep with the Fed Fund's target rate prior to August of 2007. Then what happened is the effective funds rate started to disobey. It crashed 50 or more basis points below where it was supposed to be, then it just got extremely volatile. And the Fed had no choice but to drop their rate just to compensate for the discrepancy between the actual rate where the market was trading and where they said they wanted it to be. So of course, that's not the mainstream narrative. The mainstream narrative was that the Fed dropped rates and that's what brought down the effective funds rate. But as Jeff Snyder points out, that is not true. In other words, the Fed completely lost control of interest rates and it didn't get better. It goes up and down and up and down until we go all the way till December where the effective rate crashes way below the Fed's target interest rate. That is what actually prompted the Fed to take rates down to zero. It was the tail wagging the dog and not vice versa. Whoa, 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 George. Are you actually trying to tell me that the Federal Reserve doesn't have control over the one interest rate that they're supposed to have 100% control of. And since a certain time, the market has completely controlled that interest rate. And all the Fed has done is followed the market just to make it seem like they are calling the shots. Yes and no. What I am saying is prior to this date, the Fed didn't have that problem at all. Since then, there's been periods of stress like the GFC where the Fed has definitely lost control. The market has taken over. And when could we experience another time of stress that might make the Fed completely lose control? I don't know. Maybe September 17th in the repo market or today with the Cerveza sickness. And if you're having a hard time believing this, keep in mind, this is not the only chart that Jeff sent me. He sent me two more charts going into 2008 that back this up. Editor, let's throw up the charts. What's shocking about this chart is we assume that the individual trades for 
the Fed funds stays in a very narrow range. But what we can see is that the interest rate fluctuates wildly intraday. Going back to that specific date, August 9th, 2007, although the effective Fed funds rate did drop sharply below the Fed funds target, we see that there's several trades where the interest rates went all the way down to zero. Keep in mind, Fed funds at the time, the target rate, was over 5%. And going into 2008, the volatility stayed extremely high. And it wasn't uncommon for Fed funds to actually trade over 300 basis points lower than the Fed's target rate. And you may be asking yourself, well, George, what about IOER or IOR, interest on reserves, when the Fed started paying the banks to keep their reserves at the Fed, didn't that set a floor on interest rates to give the Fed more control? Not really. This chart shows where they started IOER and clearly the effective funds rate did not obey. And it even looks like at the end of 2008, the Fed capitulated, couldn't control interest rates, so they just threw up their hands, said, screw it, we'll just drop IOER all the way down to where it's obvious the market wants the Fed funds rate. And let's remember, interest rates are one of the main components keeping this whole system glued together. And I actually think glued is probably a strong word. Let's go ahead and call it scotch taped together. And your friend and family member Fred is saying, don't worry about it because the Fed has those interest rates under control. After seeing all of this data, the charts, the facts, would you say that the Federal Reserve is in control of interest rates? Personally, I don't think so. And neither does Jeff Snyder. And oh, by the way, update on the stock market, it's now down 434 points. Hashtag vol is back. I wouldn't want to be one of those funds that short volatility right now. Step number three is this stock market crash the end game? To answer that question, let's define end game. And I see that as something that looks like 2008 or worse. Let's go back in time, look at a chart of the S&P 500, 1,000 to 3,000. In 2006, tops out at over 1,500, goes all the way down, loses 50% or more of its value, bottoms out in 2008. I want to point out that this is a result of a loss of confidence. Yes, you can point to the housing crisis. You can point to mortgage-backed securities. But as I've shown in previous videos, that was really the straw that broke the camel's back. The real problem was a loss of confidence. So stocks go down by 50%. Housing goes down by 50%. Since then, the Fed comes in, injects money, increases confidence, and the market goes up, 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 all the way to an all-time high over 3,300. We've dropped down to between 2,800 and 2,900, pending on the day. There's <laughs> so much volatility right now. I don't even know what it is, but it's somewhere in that range. If we have another 2008 crash, the market again goes down by 50% or more. That takes us right about to 1500, the highs that we reached back in 2006. But I want to point out that now the risk is much higher in the system, as we talked about in steps number one and two. The debt is extremely high at all-time highs. When you look at sovereign debt, consumer debt, state pension fund debt, and corporate debt, rates are extremely low. And let's remember, by the Fed's own admission, 
to prevent a recession or to control the downside of a recession, they've got to drop interest rates by 500 basis points. Where are you going to go when interest rates right now are at 150 basis points? Also, the Fed has $4 trillion plus on their balance sheet. Are they going to double it? Are they going to triple that? And the government is running recession level deficits. Not to mention that we know through analyzing Jeff Snyder's work that the Fed really doesn't have control over interest rates. And that brings us back to this confidence that is so important. In my mind, when I'm trying to analyze the probabilities of this being the end game, it's really a battle between the Fed and the government and the news of the Cerveza sickness. Editor, let's throw up some of these headlines to see what the Fed and the government are up against. How a cruise ship holiday turned into a nightmare. Iran VP infected Saudi halts pilgrimage, spreading to more countries globally with the Netherlands, Estonia, Denmark confirming first cases. And this type of headline will really make it sink in for the average American. Bill Gates says the is a pandemic and a once in a century pathogen. And we already know what the Fed and the government will try to do to instill confidence. That would be QE, ZERP, and of course, everyone's favorite, more money printing. But what they're up against is not only headlines, but reality. What I mean by that, all these real people that as of a week ago had all this paper wealth, they thought their purchasing power was this. All of a sudden, it starts to shrink and shrink rapidly. Soon they realize that their real wealth, their real purchasing power isn't up here. It's all the way down here. You combine that with a slowdown in the economy. And I'm going to be doing more videos on the economic impact of the Cerveza sickness. But it takes an economic slowdown, which turns into a recession or worse. At a certain point in time, people look out the window. They look at their own bank account. They look at the job they don't have. They juxtapose that to Donald Trump's Twitter feed. And reality wins the day. And I'm really confident in this because at some point in time, some black swan, some event is going to show the general public everything that you and I already know. And that's the quantitative easing ZERP. All these crazy tools are merely a placebo. So going back to the original question, is this the end game? My specific answer to that and how I see this playing out in my own mind is it depends on one thing. That is a cure for the Cerveza sickness. If we don't get a cure, in my opinion, the probability that we go through a 2008 or worse is extremely high. If we do get a cure, then it's right back to business as usual, the old placebo, but keep in mind, at some point in time, everyone is going to see that the emperor has no clothes. And for one last update, stock market down 875 points. Hashtag vol is back. For more content that'll help you build wealth and thrive in a world of out of control central banks and big governments, check out this playlist right here. And I will see you on the next video.